number 13. Right, there's a function here, and you've got a trig expression. You have to find the value of the derivative at zero. Now, don't put zero into x to begin with before you differentiate, because you'll just end up with a number, and the derivative would be zero. No. What you've got here, though, isn't quite as simple as just sine. It's a function of a function. It's not just sine of x, it's sine of something else. So when it comes to differentiating it, you're going to be using the function of the function procedure, the chain rule. So what's going to happen is you would start off the same way. Well, the coefficient's just a coefficient. The derivative of the sine of something is the positive of the cos of whatever that thing is. If it was x, it would just be x, that'd be fine, that'd be the end of it. But if it's not just x, then you have to multiply it by the derivative of the inner function of the 3x, and the derivative of 3x is 3. So what you've got is 12 cos 3x. I'll just keep in a bracket just now. So if you want the value of the derivative when x is 0, that means you'll have 12 cos of 3 times 0, which is 0, and remembering the cosine graph starts at the top, starts at 1 is 0. So you've got 12 times 1, which is 12. Which means the answer for number 13 should be 12, which is C. Number 14. An equilateral triangle of side 3 units is shown. What's the value of P dot Q? Well, equilateral triangle of side 3, that means all the sides are 3 and all the angles are 60. So there's 60 degrees between them. Now, one thing you've had to watch out for is, it's all right in this case, but if those arrows had been reversed, or if that arrow had been reversed, then the angle between them wouldn't have been 60, because the angle you use between them in the scalar product is the angle between them as they radiate away from each other. So if that arrow had been facing that, we'd have had to consider this diagram, P going like this, and Q starting at the same place that P started at, which would be Q going this way. In which case, if that's 60, it would have been 120 you'd have been using for P dot Q. But it's not. It was going the correct way, so the angle was, in fact, 60 degrees. So that means P dot Q is simply going to be the length of P, which is 3, times the length of Q, which is also 3, times the cosine of the angle between them, which is 60. Now, what's the value for 60 degrees? You remember your triangle with 60 and 30 in it. That's the 1 for the short one opposite the 30. 2 for the hypotenuse and root 3. 1, 2, root 3. The cosine means what's next to the 60. That's the 1 over the hypotenuse, which is a half. So you've got 3 times 3, which is 9, times the half, which is 9 upon 2. And 9 upon 2 is answer B. Number 15, here's three three-dimensional points, which are collinear, so you know these three points lie in a line, and it says S divides it, so you've got S, then T, then U, and it says what's the ratio in which it divides them? Now, what are these two parts here then? Well, you don't need to do the whole lot and find the complete vector ST with all three of its components, and the vector TU with all three of its components, because if they're collinear, then the each of the components should divide to the same fraction. So you can just consider one of them, and then just scan which is the nicest one. Well, the z's are all positive. So if you just took the z components, so in the vectors, that'd be the bottom ones, like the 1, and then the 16, and then the 26. If you just took the bottom part of it, if you just take the z components, what have you got? Well, you can always see what happens. As you go from s to t, you're going from 1 to 16. So going from S to T, that's 15 forward. And then going from T to U, I'm going from 16 to 26, so that's 10, which means ST to TU is going to be 15 to 10, dividing them both by 5, 3 to 2. And 3 to 2 is answer B. Number 16, an integration to do, an indefinite integral, where you're going to have to sort it out to begin with, get the x and top in index form, and notice that the selection of answers have got the x's back in the denominator, in other words, put it back the way you found it. Well, the first thing is, I can't integrate it yet, that x will have to go on top. So a power 4 underneath is the same as an x to negative 4 on top, and you could either write over 3, which I just did, or a third of it. 
Then integrating what happens, you add 1 to the power, so it goes up to negative 3. You then divide by negative 3. Well, that means there'll be another 3 going to join it in the denominator, making it negative altogether. And don't forget the plus C. It doesn't matter particularly in paper 1 in multiple choice because you can see them all in the answers, but it's just a good habit not to forget that. So that means I've got negative. Now that negative 3 means it should be underneath. So not only is the 9 underneath, but that x is underneath as well. So you've got negative 1 upon 9 x cubed. I suppose the important part here is don't take the 3 up with the x. If you took that 3 up with the x, it would have to appear on top as 3 to the negative 1. And what does 3 to the negative 1 mean? It just means the 3 is underneath again. There's no point doing that. Oh, so what's the answer for this one? So for number 16, we've got negative 1 upon 9, that's A.